Hi there. Um, I rarely ever do Instagram lives, at least I rarely ever initiate them, but uh, today I was inspired to initiate uh, an Instagram live because um, something interesting occurred. Um, so a young woman, a, a very young lady, a young girl uh, who was 12 years old at the time she wrote, her name is uh, John C. Patel. She wrote in to me through my website and uh, she said that she was 12 years old and she discovered, and I think she's 13 now actually, and uh, she discovered my TED talk, my TEDx talk five years ago, which means she would have only been about seven or eight at the time. And she said that it actually changed the way that she views life. So um, she says she does a little a podcast called Learn On Podcast. And she wrote in inviting me if to ask if I would be willing on her podcast. I was so touched by her email, you know, by this uh, innovative young girl. And um, she basically, her podcast is uh, by young people herself and her little brother. You can see them there now. Hi. 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 Thank you Hi. so much for having us. You're so welcome. You guys are so cute. Um, and so, yeah, so I decided to invite them to be on my Instagram. And of course, you are welcome to share this on your podcast. So thank you for coming on. You guys are an inspiration for other, not only other young people, but also um, I want you to, I'm gonna get into this later, but I want to help other parents of young children, particularly empath children, because you guys are obviously empaths. Um, but what I'm gonna do is, because you invited me to be on your podcast, I'm going to kick it over to you and have you interview me first, and then I'll interview you guys after, okay? Yeah, we just have to say like, thank you so much for having us. And yeah, you were a big inspiration for us to start this initiative and we'll talk a little bit about it later, but I can't believe that we're here today and thank you so much for this opportunity. You are so welcome. And I just wanna add something so, um, so after you wrote in to us and then my team and I, we, we looked up, you know, some of your podcasts and some of your videos and both of you, and we were so blown away. And I swear, this is what my team said. They, we all said, you, you guys are more intelligent than all of us adults put together. So we were so blown away. So thank you. Um, thank you. We just think you're an inspiration for other people. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. So I think without further ado, if you're ready, we can get started. Yep, let's do it. All right. So like you mentioned, your story has been a great source of motivation for us. And if I went back in time and told myself when I was like eight years old watching your TED Talk that we'd be interviewing you today, I wouldn't believe it. But so for the new listeners here or the people that are not fully aware, can you please describe your life-changing experience and what your story is all about? Sure. So in... Um... 2006, I actually, I died, I crossed over, and it was a result of end-stage cancer. Um, I had cancer, I had lymphoma, lymphatic cancer for four years, um, which had spread throughout my lymphatic system, where I had tumors the size of golf balls from the base of my skull, all around my neck, my chest, uh, under my arms, in, and into my abdomen. And by that point, as it progressed over the four years, um, my body stopped absorbing nutrition. I weighed about 85 pounds. I couldn't walk. Um, I was completely emaciated. I, um, uh, I was, my lungs were filled with fluid and my organs started to shut down and I couldn't even breathe properly because my lungs were filled with fluid. And so I went into a coma. And at that point, my, uh, the doctors told my family that I was not going to come out of the coma. And it was at that point that I crossed over into the other side. And when I was there, I felt incredible. All the pain was gone. All the fear was gone. The fear of the illness, the fear of treatments, the fear of everything was just gone. 
And I just felt light and free. And I felt just enveloped by this feeling of just pure, unconditional love. And while I was there, I encountered the, um, I encountered the soul or the spirit of my deceased father, my dad. And my dad wanted me to know that it wasn't my time to die and that, and he encouraged me to come back. And at first, no part of me wanted to come back into this physical body. But I started to realize that um, I had never allowed myself to be who I am. And I started to realize or understand why I had got sick in the first place. And I understood that now that I knew this truth, if I chose to come back, that my body would heal very, very quickly. So there's a lot that happened while I was there because I was in the coma for 36 hours. But um, this is kind of the short version. And, uh, and so when, when I made the decision that I would come back, my dad said to me, now that you know the truth, go back and live your life fearlessly. That was the one instruction he gave me, was to live your life fearlessly. And so um, that was when, in that moment, I started, my physical body started to open my eyes. When I was on that other side, it felt as if I had left my body behind and I was there in spirit without a physical body. And so when I made the decision to come back into my body, um, my body started to come out of the coma, which shocked the doctors and my family. And in four days, the tumors shrunk by about 60%. In three and a half weeks, they could find no sign of cancer in my body. And in five wow. weeks, um, I was, yeah, and in five weeks, I was released from the hospital to go home and live my life cancer free. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. And yeah, that your story has always stuck with me. And specifically, um, I mentioned to you the metaphor of like the flashlight and then the lights in the warehouse. And I just think that's so amazing. And um, it, I think it has like a lot to do and shows a lot about how your mental health has so much to do with your physical health and they're connected in ways more than we could ever imagine. Yeah, exactly right mental emotional all of that is is such a big part of our physical body and we don't we you know our our medical system our big the way that we handle illnesses most of the time they don't even take that in as a factor but that is in fact to me the bigger part of it it's the bigger part of our physical health is how we deal with it mentally and emotionally definitely so how did changing your mindset during this experience allow you to physically and mentally heal? So that's a great question. The biggest change that happened with me was that I suddenly realized that my life had meaning and purpose. And there was a reason that I'm here and that I, I matter. I had never known that before. I never knew that. And it's interesting how we can go into adulthood without realizing that our lives actually have meaning and matter and that our soul has chosen to come here at this time through these parents and to live in this body and our soul has chosen it and and that um that and and that we have a purpose and we have a reason for being here and i never knew that i always felt that my life didn't matter as much as other people's. I would not take care of myself. I put, always put myself last. I always criticized myself. I always felt I wasn't good enough. I would beat myself up. I was always seeking other people's approval. Um, and when, even when I was not well, even when I was sick, I would still take care of other people and worry more about what other people were going through than myself. And in other words, even when I was sick, I didn't want to disturb and bother other people with my illness. Um, so 
that's how little I thought of myself. And it was death that actually taught me that, wow, your soul is a piece of God. It's a, it's a facet of God. And it has chosen to come here now to live through this body. And if I don't love myself, it means I don't love my soul, which means I don't love that facet of God that has chosen to come and express itself here. And if I don't love that facet of God, I am denying that soul or that facet of God from expressing itself. And what right do I have to deny a piece of God, a facet of God from expressing itself through me here in this time and space? That's what really changed the way I think. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Yes, and that's course. why we l love to talk about self-care. And especially, I think, learning about it at a young age and teaching it to other people is really important because the ideals that you have, like in your childhood and in your early stages of life, they are with you forever. So, yeah, that's why we love what we do. I love what you guys do, too. I wish I knew what I know now at your age. You guys are so ahead of your time. You, Thank you, you. you won't believe Thank it. You. Yeah. And also, what do you think was the connection between your mental state and also recovering from cancer? I think that that had everything to do with it. Because if... I didn't believe in myself if I didn't realize. So in that moment, so let's go back to that moment when um, I decided to come back, when my dad said that you still have gifts waiting for you, you need to go back. And so at first, no part of me wanted to come back. But then when he said that um, my purpose was linked with my husband's purpose and that um, now that I know this and my body would heal and I, and I need to, and then I started to realize that I needed to value myself and love myself and that I had been a doormat. Um, so it was in that moment where I made the decision from there, when my soul made the decision to come back into my physical body, that my body healed, which means that when we know from a deep level, and this is even deeper than your mental state, it's more your, your spiritual state, your emotional state. When you know that you have a, a purpose, when you have a reason to live, that then your body is much more likely to heal when you have a reason to live. So to answer your question in a deeper way, if somebody feels like they have no reason to live, if they're really lonely and they've suffered a lot of trauma recently and they feel they're a burden to people around them and, and if they feel the people around them are better off without them, then they lose their will to live. Then they're less likely to have a reason to go from one day to another. And so if they have an illness or something, they're more likely to succumb to the illness because they feel that they are a burden on other people. But if somebody has a passion for life and knows there's a reason they need to be here and they have people who love them and people who they love and they've healed all their past traumas and whatever they need to heal and they have a love for life, they are much more likely to heal from any illness. That's so important for people to know. Yeah, definitely. Self-love is so important. And then subsequently practicing self-care to have that self-love is also very, very important. And we do have a lot of experience that of our own. Yes, it's so important. Go ahead. So how are our ideals of mindfulness and self-love are interwined with your journey? So the ideals of mindfulness and self-love is really important because it all starts with self-love. If you don't love yourself, you don't give yourself permission to follow your passion or be loved by others. When you don't love yourself, you can't believe that other people love you. So you almost deny other people from loving you when you don't love yourself. When you feel self-loathing, and somebody shows love to you, you kind of think, why would they love me? I'm not lovable. They must want something from me. So you become suspicious of everybody when you don't love yourself. 
Um, when you don't love yourself, not only are you suspicious of everybody, you don't allow yourself to have fun. You don't allow yourself to spend money on yourself. You don't allow yourself to take care of yourself or to eat healthy foods. You will buy the cheapest stuff possible because you don't think you deserve it. When you don't love yourself, you, you actually energetically, you push away opportunities, you push away abundance, money, all kinds of things because you don't feel you're deserving and worthy. Um, and, you, and if somebody compliments you, you say, no, you don't feel you deserve it. You kind of go, no, 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 um, I'm not like that. And, and so you're very um, self-effacing. Uh, I think I've got that word right. But, but um, so basically, it's very, very paramount and fundamental to teach young people to love themselves because only if you truly love yourself and I mean loving your whole self, including loving your soul, the whole you, like, uh, like your, your, your mindfulness, your every part of you, your consciousness, loving all of you, then when you really learn to do that, do you, are you really healthy enough to even be okay if you fail? The people who struggle with failing and failure are people who don't love themselves. When you love yourself, you handle it, you take it in stride. People who don't love themselves suffer more when they get sick as well. When you love yourself, uh, you know you're gonna be okay. You trust your body, you trust that your body has an innate ability to heal. When you love yourself, you know you have a purpose here. And you are also open to opportunities. You're open to uh, abundance and, uh, and, and also when you love yourself, you take better care of yourself. You eat healthier food. You allow yourself to nourish yourself well, body, mind, and spirit. So that's why mindfulness and loving yourself is so important. And it's important to start at a young age like yourselves. Yeah, definitely. Um, we totally agree. Yeah. Exactly. For my last question, what advice do you have for someone that feels unhappy with their current life position? So I have tons of things to tell them. So that's such a great question. Um, I would say that if you are unhappy, first of all, know that everything passes. Nothing stays the same forever. So don't despair it will pass. It really will. It always does. I would also want them to know that um, they are not alone. There are a lot of people who go through ups. Everybody, not a lot of people, but everybody would relate to them. Everybody relates to people who are struggling and who are suffering. So I would really want them to know that. Then I would start to ask them to practice what I call receiving. So mindfulness is another really good thing, but, a, but an important practice that I teach people is the practice of receiving. Most people who don't love themselves and who are struggling, they're very, very generous and they're very good at giving, but they're terrible at receiving. They don't know how to receive for themselves. They don't, um, they don't think they're deserving or worthy. And so they're always giving. And so they feel miserable because very often their own batteries are depleted. In other words, their energy is depleted from giving and giving of themselves, but never receiving. So I would ask them to be aware of their tendency to do that, be mindful of that tendency. And also I would ask them to start a practice of learning to receive by receiving something every single day, even if it's something that they have to give themselves. And it could be anything, it could be time, it could be a walk in nature, it could be a soak in a tub, it could be just giving themselves the time to relax. But yeah. it really is about learning to receive and about filling up their own cup and practices like that. Definitely, and I'd also like to share like for um, anything difficult that I like I go through or anything like that I like to remind myself that everything happens for a good reason and so even if it may not seem like it's going in your favor in that current moment things will change 
and everything happens for a reason. I think your story is such a good representative of that. Wow, thank you. Yeah, thank of you. course. And you've published uh, five books to date, one of which is a New York Times bestseller. So for your most recent book, Sensitive is the New Strong, The Power of Empaths in an Increasingly Harsh World, what is, what is it about and how can empathy change our world for the better? Okay, so let me dive into that. Oh, and just before that, um, I just wanted to mention the fifth book is going to be coming out soon. Uh, so yes, so four already published. And that was, uh, yeah, and that was, I know it was based on the information that we gave you. So, um, so the, my most recent book, Sensitive is the New Strong, what it's based on is the fact that we have um, a lot of sensitive people in the world, but sensitive people, people who are really sensitive and people who are empaths, people who like yourselves, children like yourselves, who are very mindful, um, who are very aware that, that our mind and our emotions and all of that matters. People like us, we tend to struggle more in the world because it often feels like the world was created by, um, so I call sensitive people six sensory beings. So let me start with that. The reason why I call us six sensory beings is because um, when you are sensitive, what it means is that you feel very strongly, you feel deeply your sense of feeling, your intuition, or you feel other people's emotions, you're aware of how other people are feeling. And that feeling, that, that sensitivity, sensitivity is very strong and very loud for you. It's as strong as your sense of smell or sight or hearing or touch um, or taste. So basically you are a six sensory being when you are highly sensitive or if you're an empath. However, it feels like that this world is created by five sensory beings for five sensory beings. So people who are sensitive, we're very impacted by everything all around us. We're impacted, like for example, the ads on TV, they can impact us and, and we're very sensitive to that. Like drug ads, for example, I, I thoroughly dislike drug ads that that drop all these suggestions of illnesses and then get you to go talk to your doctor about it. I thoroughly dislike those. Um, I thoroughly dislike the way the news media makes everything into a breaking news so that it triggers anxiety in sensitive people all the time, all day long, anxiety. I don't yeah. much care for the way our medical system treats people, particularly sensitive people. It's not even taken into account that some people are sensitive and their physical symptoms might be triggered by their sensitivity and their anxiety. So our sensitivity is dismissed every step of the way. Even our education system is not targeted for sensitive children. We don't teach yeah. empathy. We don't encourage empathy. We encourage things like competition and, and getting ahead. And so we then, so if every system, if every major system of ours dismisses empathy, sympathy, empaths, sensitivity, all of these things. And if we all worship ruthlessness, brute force, and vote such people into power and leadership roles, then that's what we see in the world. And then we wonder why the world is so messed up. So basically this book is about embracing your sensitivity because the way the world is now, the sensitive people feel as though something is wrong with them. Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the sensitive people actually are what is needed most right now. So this book encourages sensitive people to embrace who you are, know that sensitivity is a strength, know that our culture needs to start to recognize sensitivity as a strength and not as a weakness particularly if we want to see some changes in the world. So that's what the book is about. And it teaches you on an individual level how to embrace your sensitivity and how to navigate the world with it in a more effective way. So yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. We actually we did the empath quiz on your website. And I can definitely relate to like a lot of things that you talked about. So yeah, those were all of the questions that we had. I think we learned a lot, right? Of course. Yeah, this was really awesome. And I believe you had a few questions for us. So we can talk about that now.
I absolutely did. You guys are awesome. Like really, Thank really, you. like I, Thank I can't, you. I can't get over it. And so one of the questions I, I had was that you mentioned in your uh, letter that watching my TED talk changed the way you view life. I would love to know how it changed, like what changed for you. And you were only like eight years old. So yeah. uh, I'm curious to know how it affected you as an eight year old. Yeah, sure. So I think like one of the biggest reasons why it affected me so much because I was young. So I was young enough to understand like what you were talking about and um, like properly understand some of the concepts, but it was like the first time that I was hearing about something like that. It was actually my mom who had shown it. She loves that type of stuff. So um, yeah, I think, and like I said, it was the metaphor specifically of the flashlight in the warehouse and that awareness and understanding. And I realized that there's a lot more things going on with almost any person at any given time than what is like on the surface. So the way that your cancer occurred, right? Somebody might have just um, dismissed it as something just like maybe um, based on your genetics or something like that. When, as you explained, it had a lot to do with your mindset and how you were feeling in your life at that given time. And so I think it always was in the back of my mind and it encouraged me to look at, like, realize what other people might be going through and to just be, like you said, sensitive of um, other things that are going on and like that. And since it had such a big impact on my life, that's also a big reason why we decided to start this project so that we can spread that message to other people. Wow. Wow, uh, we we need kids like you, and um, thank you. And thank and so, yeah. And how? What do you think? Um, how do you think that adults and parents and teachers could make it easier for sensitive children uh, currently, like to be able to be who they are, or even to spread their message the way you are? What could adults do, basically? to make life easier for kids, for amazing kids like you? Yeah, sure, do you wanna take that question? Uh, okay, so, so parents should maybe encourage kids by taking care of their mental health and, and be aware if they're being stressed out. It's, it's totally okay to have high goals, but, but you also want to make sure that the kid is not feeling overwhelmed or or stressed or or anxious or of doing the of doing work and that they find hard to do it's they should be in a happy way and and they should have yeah, also have high goals but not too high where where they're where they're being really stressed yeah, and I think teachers should try to understand the children and put themselves in their shoes. So, for example, like when conflicts happen, which is basically inevitable at school, right? Um, they should, instead of, you know, just directly going to punishment um, and like coming up with some disciplinary action to try and understand what is going through the child's mind when that happens and not just to like talk with them but talk with them in a safe and non-judgmental way because kids are very perceptive and you can tell right when somebody is judging you or making assumptions compared to when they're really listening so I think like openly listening to their perspective and listening to what they have to say is really really important and so when teachers and parents are practicing empathy and sensitiveness towards the child, the child is more likely to then also incorporate that um, towards their peers. And I know that um, Sanaa and I, like, we have amazing parents and we have amazing role models in our lives. And so that's also why we are able to do this right now. Yeah, you kids are amazing and blessed. I'm so glad your parents you. are who they are, really, yeah. both of you. And Sanaa, how old are you? you? Did you say you're- I'm eight? seven. Seven, oh my God. <laughs> You're, you're really incredible kids. And you know, um, Jansi, what you just said, that if the teachers are, are sensitive, that really helps a lot. If they speak to you in a sensitive way and the teachers are sensitive, that really, really helps a lot. Um, I yeah. love that. Um, do you have any, uh, um, sorry. So the, uh, one of the things that you had said, which I actually loved, is that you actually don't like 
um, prescription, the, um, actually it was on one of your other videos that we looked at. You spoke about pulling the drug ads um, off, the, off TV. So I'm assuming that you too are sensitive to those and probably other kids too, right? Yeah, so for a little bit of background, um, I do speech and debate. I've been doing it since I was in like third grade, and I really love it. And Sanai is also going to be starting it soon. That's why okay. like, we love talking to other people. Um, so that was uh, in a part of congressional debate, right, where we talk about different legislations or laws that we have maybe already um, put into process for our country or maybe we're planning to or just something that's going on in the media at that time and as if we are in Congress and debating that legislation thinking about whether we want to put it into effect or if we want to make any changes anything like that so the legislation at that time was prescription drug ads and so um, DTC or direct to consumer prescription drug ads the research that I had done was that they misinform patients right because they promote drug before long-term safety information is known. There's a lot of different um, medicines that have been advertised and then given to patients only to have adverse reactions because they didn't study like how it looks over decades, not just a couple of years. Yes. And then they also like medicalize and stigmatize normal conditions and bodily functions. And so that goes back to like our thing with mental health, that it is important to take care of yourself. It's not just being, you know, overly sensitive. It is important. And so that sort of has that same concept. And they then because they have this sense of misinformation, right, healthcare professionals might feel pressured to prescribe them to patients because if a patient sees that specific drug or even just the name brand, right, and they go to their doctor and they really, really want it, even though the doctor recognizes that it's not in the best interest of the patient, that can like strain the relationship. So it again goes with like mindfulness, you know, and being aware of how it may affect different people. So yeah, that's definitely a topic I feel passionate about. I love that. That was great information right there. You're like, blowing my mind. Thank you. So Thank you. tell me more, both of you, um, how do you, how would you teach kids mindfulness? Okay, so I think one of the most important things is to have it in your curriculum, right? Because like Sunai, I know I'm going to be going into high school. So, but Sunai, like you've already had, even though you're just going into third grade, right? You've had a lot of classes about like health, right? And talking about like nutrition exercise. So almost all of the kids at his age, right, that go to like any school know about that. And so it's so like widespread, right, that you need to take care of your body, right? Eat good food, exercise, all of that. But we don't have the same things going on for our mind, right? We don't talk too much about how these everyday routines that we have, how much it can impact your mental well-being and then your physical well-being as well. So I think that we should try to make it a bit more widespread in schools, have that as a part of our curriculum. And then also I want to talk about how um, another big thing that encouraged me to get into mindfulness and also Sanai as well, I had a band teacher. Her name is Mrs. Buckaloo. She was amazing. I had her from sixth to eighth grade. Um, and we would have every Friday, we'd have this thing called Mindfulness Fridays, where for five to ten minutes, um, we would just do like a simple breathing exercise, meditation or something like that, and then go play our instruments like we would normally do. And so I think that was really, really amazing because she taught us how it can like affect our breathing, us playing our instruments, and also just like our mind and our overall well-being. So teaching um, that in classrooms and encouraging parents and teachers to also sort of keep that up and encourage their children is really, really important. That is so sensible, and I agree with you, because I honestly think that if they introduced things like mindfulness and meditation and quiet time in schools, you yeah. would decrease bullying, you would decrease anxiety, you would decrease the need to give kids drugs, you know, for ADHD. I think all of that would decrease if mindfulness was, was taught in schools and meditation. I really yeah, definitely. Think and um, what can what do you think that adults or people or generally even people like me and others who are listening in right now what can we do to help this and to help your cause of of trying to get kids to practice mindfulness and trying to get adults to 
um, to support kids to do that, like try to get teachers and schools to support it? What can we all do to help your cause? Yeah, sure. So I think, Sana, you mentioned, right, that teachers should try to put themselves in the students' shoes and parents should encourage kids to take care of their mental health, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I think that is really, really important. If we can also make resources like more widespread for parents and teachers, because a lot of the times, you know, parents and teachers just don't have that education. They don't have that awareness in their life. So by like frowning upon mental health right in front of kids, they may not realize the damage that they're doing. They may not intend, right, for it to have negative effects, but they don't realize it. So for adults to realize that as well, and that's why we have our project. So Sanai and I, um, currently in the summer, we have the time. So every week on Sunday, we release an episode about mindfulness and mental health. We also post a lot on our Instagram, and we're going to continue doing that even as the school year starts. And, um, yeah, so we have, like, completely free resources. Everything is free and accessible as long as you have an Internet connection. So, um you can also check out our website, learnonpodcast.com, and see all of that. And just most importantly, to encourage it and share it with other people. That's incredible. You kids are amazing, amazing. I am going to encourage everybody who's going to watch this and who's watching it to follow you kids. Um, Thank your you podcast, so much. Oh, you're welcome. So please follow me on Instagram and, uh, and your podcast. Your podcast is called Learn On Podcast, right? And yes. your Instagram yep. is uh, your Instagram at learn on podcast. Yep. At learn on podcast. Great. Everybody, please follow them. I am also going to share this video on YouTube as well. Um, oh, thank you. Thank we you. We will share it. Yeah. So we'll, we'll share it and uh, uh, yeah, we'll just get that message out there. Let's keep it going. And everybody who's tuned in, please, please, share it with other people, share it with your kids. And, and please have your kids listen to learnonpodcast.com because this is information. This is basically you're a scientist, aren't you? Both of you kids, you guys are interested Thank in you. science. And, yeah. and I, I love that because, because you see this as a science and I love it, yeah. you know, because you are awake you kids are aware you know you know the truth um and i love that and so what you're creating is something by kids for kids so you guys are amazing i really really want to see you you know just get out there and 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 be something special in the world but you already are you already are yeah i think it's been like almost exactly a year like I think in just a week now we're going to hit our year-long anniversary of when we thought of it and started it so that's really really exciting to see how far our project has come already and thank you so much for helping us out coming here today we learned a lot while talking with you and we are just so happy that this collaboration could happen me too and I learned a lot too so thank you thank you so yeah. much yeah. and and we'll stay in touch Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And thank you so much to everybody that tuned in and listened. And we're also going to make this available as a podcast episode. So if you want to rewatch or anything like that or share, that would be nice. Yeah. Great. Thanks again. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.